Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. We're going to go ahead and get started, and as I've stated for the past two weeks, we've entered the portion of Hebrews that I understand why there are chapter breaks, but the chapter breaks are almost meaningless at this point because of the way that it's written. It's almost one long continuous thought, which A, to me, uh, is an indication that it may very well be Paul because he has the tendency to do this in some of his writings as well. And B, helps me relate to the Hebrew author, whoever it may be, because this is also the, uh, the way that I tend to write, uh, just long continuous thoughts. And so if you'll remember the last week, what we were covering at the tail end of chapter five is that it was the passage that we're all very familiar with about the, the dichotomy that is being presented between milk and meat. And so what he's saying is that the people that are receiving this epistle, and again, we don't know for sure who the audience is, we just have a pretty good idea that it was some group of Jewish Christians that were in danger of falling back into Judaism. So that's really all we know about them. But whoever they were, they were struggling with issues of a mature faith. They were not understanding the scripture as fully as they needed to. They didn't have a full grasp on the theological concepts, which is the purpose of this epistle. And so because of that, Paul sort of ridicules them a little bit here because he's saying, you guys should be able to tackle more mature subjects like this. You guys should actually be teaching other people by this point. But instead, we're keeping to, we're having to return over and over again to sort of what he calls the elementary principles of the scripture. And so... We're going to continue with that same line of thinking, and the author is going to do the same here in Hebrews 6, 1 through 2, where he starts out, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. I think if we were to take just an overview of this whole section of Scripture where the Hebrew author is discussing maturity and having a mature understanding of Scripture and the concepts with which he's trying to teach them, what he's trying to get them to avoid, I think, is a couple of different things. First is wanting to go back to that which is comfortable, and we talked about that at the tail end of our lesson last week, but I think one specific form of comfort that can take place, which I think even somebody that is well-learned and well-versed in the scripture can, can fall into, it's a similar kind of error where we can kind of just sit back and say, I've arrived. I know the scripture. I've got this down. I know what it means to be a Christian. And because of that, I can just kind of coast until I die and go to heaven. And I think almost nobody would actually verbalize their attitude that way. But if you're any anything like me, you've fallen into that trap before. Like there are times where we think, well, we already know what it, it means to be saved. We already know how to worship properly. We understand these sort of elementary principles that the Hebrew author is talking about. And so because of that, we can just kind of comfortably uh, ride out our Christianity until our eternal reward. And that's a dangerous mindset. And the reason that it is so dangerous is because it's easy. It doesn't challenge us. It doesn't force us to put our faith to the test. And I think that that's what the Hebrew author is trying to convey to his audience is that what it means to have a mature faith is a faith that challenges you, that forces you to consider what God wants you to do, the process by which you are to live your life and your behaviors. And so because of that, he's trying to spur them on to that kind of lifestyle to press on, which is the word that he uses here, this is something that is used elsewhere in the scripture as well when it talks about continuing to live faithfully. And this idea of pressing on, that's something that should conjure up in our minds this idea of continuing, that we are constantly working towards something. What separates a great athlete, for example, from a mediocre one is one that is constantly challenging himself, trying to push himself to his limits, trying to push himself past his limits whenever he can, and is able to 
perform at a level that is greater than previously because he's continuously working at getting better at his craft. And that's really the way we should treat our Christianity. And so if we can train ourselves to do that, constantly try to push ourselves to further our spiritual maturity, uh, further increase our relationship and our love for God, to increase our fellowship with the brethren, all of the things that make Christian life what it is, then we'll be pressing on, which is what the Hebrew author is saying here. And he's contrasting that idea with this idea of not laying a foundation of repentance on dead works. And he, and he lists off several things here. Uh, first of all, dead works and faith towards God, those fundamental ideas, and then instruction about washings and laying of hands and about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So what I want to ask here is this verse has been used for this justification before, and so I want to ask you here, is what he is espousing here sort of this idea of faith only? Because this is something that we're probably familiar with. He's saying that we, we don't want these sort of elementary principles of repentance by dead works. And so is he saying that works are not essential for salvation, that that's, that's a dead thing, and because of it we don't need that? Is that what the Hebrew author is saying here? That is an unfortunate thing that happens sometimes to people when they read the Bible which is especially silly when you consider it wasn't even originally written in English. They'll find a word and think, well, this word must mean exactly the same thing every single time it's used in the Scripture. But that's not the case. You know, when God says to the Israelites, you should paint the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost, we know the door that he's talking about is an actual physical door. Well, thousands of years later, when Jesus says, I am the door, is he saying, I'm a literal door? No, he's not. And so, Words change in the Scripture based on their context. Now, sometimes we can draw some insight from that, but you're absolutely right. When we're talking about this idea of works, when we see works in the New Testament, every single time it doesn't mean specifically good works or works that a Christian is expected to do. Sometimes it does mean that, but oftentimes it doesn't, especially when we're talking about Judaism. What is being discussed here could very well be the works of the law. That, that could be an interpretation of it. I'm going to offer an alternate one, which also is not good works that he's talking about, because if you will look at Hebrews 9.14, and I know we're jumping ahead just a little bit, but I think seeing how the same author uses this just a little bit later in the same epistle is going to be helpful for us. If you look in Hebrews 9 verse 14, you'll see it says, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So in that context, he's not talking about works of the law, but he's also not talking about good works, the works that are called for, for example, in Galatians and Ephesians. What he's talking about there is the works that a sinful person engages in before they know Christ. And so if that's the case, this is actually a third meaning of the word works that we're seeing in here. Now, I think it could very well be works of the law, which is what you were talking to. I think that that is a, a not improper interpretation of that verse. But considering that just a few verses later, he also uses this idea of dead works, talking about the works that you are dead to once you become a Christian and have been bathed in the blood of Christ and resurrected with him in newness of life. That seems to be what he's actually talking about. And that makes sense in the context, right? Because he's talking about the fundamentals of Christianity. Well, getting away, getting out of sin and away from the lifestyle that you had before you were a Christian, that would be a pretty foundational idea when it comes to Christianity. And so it seems as though that's what he's speaking about here. Yes, sir. That's absolutely correct. And there's really not another way to interpret that, is there? Because if it's talking about service, it must be talking about good works. And so, yeah, that's, that's an absolutely... I didn't even think about that, but that's an excellent observation. So let's go ahead and read the next few verses. Let's go uh, Hebrews 6, 3 through 6. And this we will do, if God permits. For it is impossible, in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away 
to restore them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now, you may recall a couple weeks ago we were reading similar verses. uh, I believe it's in chapter 3. And I said, and I stand by this, I just don't see how anybody can read the book of Hebrews and continue to believe once saved, always saved. I mean, it's just a running theme throughout the entire epistle. The existence of the epistle itself is a warning to Christians that have been saved to not fall back into their old ways. And so the entirety of this, if you ask me, is, is just a, a glaring, obvious teaching that Christians have the ability to fall away and the author is warning them not to do that and let themselves slip back into Judaism. And what the verbiage that it uses here, I think is is interesting where he talks about fallen. Well, when he talks about, you know, uh, this idea of fallen, what do you have to do to fall? You cannot fall from somewhere that you've never been. Like if, if you were to come across somebody who's broken their arm and they say what happened is like, well, he, he fell off of that hill over there. Well, when did he go up the hill? Well, he, he's never been on the hill. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You have to be on the hill before you can fall off the hill. You, you have to be you know, on the bike before you can fall off of your bike. Like we understand this is, is, is common knowledge and, and just any rational person would assume that. And yet somehow we're to believe that these verses mean that, well, that means that that person was never a Christian. Well, that's not what the verse says. It's very clear here that this is a genuine danger to those even after they have obtained salvation if they forsake it and rebel against God again. And so the question that I think that this could raise, where it talks about it being impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, uh, for them to, if you look down at verse 6, and for those who have fallen away to restore them again into repentance... Does that mean that a person that has fallen away, that God cannot forgive such a person? And I think that that's correct, that typically when you see somebody that has at one time done exactly what is being described in this verse, that is is, has tasted of the heavenly gift, that usually that person, it's very difficult for them to come back, and that's what you said, but, and I agree with that, but very difficult doesn't mean impossible. This verse says it's impossible for them to be restored to repentance. So what is being taught here? Is is he saying that once you've fallen away, that's it? You have no way to find God's repentance again? Can you you not come back? Is the door closed at that point? No, I I do think you're right, though. There is a difference in falling and falling away. Um, If if I'm understanding this verse correctly, and I, I hope that I am, um, where he's talking about those who, that have been enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift, been partakers in the Holy Spirit. Once someone has reached that and openly rejected it, he's not saying that that is not somebody that can come again to repentance. He's saying while they are in that state, they cannot come to repentance. If a Christian, whether intentionally or inadvertently, sins, but they are still praying to God, asking for repentance, trying to get better, and trying to have that transformative power of Jesus Christ working in their lives and doing the best that they can to try to reflect his life. Repentance exists for that person. I mean, that's all throughout the New Testament. What is being taught here is once someone has rejected that, they are no longer seeking repentance, that repentance is no longer available to them. I believe that that person could come back to the faith, that they could repent of their rebellion, but he's saying while they're in this fallen state, while they have rejected God and are in open rebellion against him, at that point it's impossible for them to have repentance from God. They cannot be restored to repentance while they are in that rebellious state. And the reason that I think he's trying to punctuate this at the end of verse 6, he says, because those people crucify themselves to the Son of God and put Him to open shame. The reason that he is expounding upon this idea, and and I think the reason that he's saying that a person that is in that open rebellion, especially someone who has known the truth and had a relationship with Christ and then turned away from that, the reason that he is using this to punctuate it is he's saying that that person knows what they're doing. 
when they engage in that sin. They know what that means. Right, and, and there is a, an important distinction there because in this idea about being uh, involved in the world and then being entangled in it, that is a person that has, they understand what is being done. Like they understand what their rebellion means. They know what they're saying no to, essentially. They understand that when they reject Christ, they know who they're saying no to. And once a person has gone to that place, repentance isn't an option for them, at least not while they're in that state. And so I think that that's the teaching that is, is being brought here into Daniel's point. That's something that it's hard to break that mindset once somebody knows what they're missing out on and has chosen to forsake it anyway. And remember that the reason that Paul is bring, or Paul, the Hebrew author, the reason the Hebrew author is bringing this to their attention is specifically because he's saying, you are in danger of this. He wouldn't be bringing it up if that wasn't something that they could very well fall into. And that's been the theme of his entire epistle so far, right? He's trying to convince them going back into Judaism is not an option anymore. And if you turn away from this, if you say no to the Savior, this is the state of being that you will be caught up in. So let's read verses 7 through 8. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and produces vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Now, personally, I really like these two verses just because it sounds very Old Testament-y, if that makes any sense. It's, it's very much like one of the old prophets, and it's, it's also very similar to Jesus' parables, and so it kind of reminds me of that line of thinking. Uh, but the real thrust of what he's saying here is, if something like what we were just talking about in the previous verse happens, if you have fallen away, that's on you. Because God's the one that makes it rain. He has given you everything you need to be fruitful. You have the good soil, you have the rain, and if you have all of that and all you're getting is thorns and thistles, that's a you problem. And so God has given us everything that we need to succeed. He's given us everything that we need to follow him. And that's what he's kind of expounding on here. But here's the follow-up question. Why would good soil and adequate rain yield thorns and thistles? And I'm asking in the very literal sense, not necessarily the, the spiritual sense. Well, why is that happening? Exactly. The difference in growing a, a thistle bush and growing fruit is what you put into the ground. And I think that that's very important because we know if we're, I'm not saying that this is a perfect equation, but if we're looking back at Jesus' teaching about the sowing of the seed, the seed in that story is the word of God. And so if you're getting bad seed, I think that the closest spiritual analogy we can find to that is false teaching. What they are yielding up through the, the ground that has fallen on them, even if there's good soil there, if it's bad seed, if it's bad fruit, it's because false teaching has taken root. And this false teaching of, well, you can go back to Judaism and it's just the same, or if you're going to more the Judaizers, which is more the subject of, like, for example, Galatians, something like that, any other false teaching, take your pick. That is the fruit of that seed. Even if all of the other conditions are there, if you start with error, you get more error. You ever, when you were in elementary school, make like a little bitty error early on in a math problem, and then your answer is like way off? Well, that's what it's talking about. If you start with an error, even if it's a little bitty, the further on down the line you get, the more error comes. And we can see this throughout history. There's a lot of churches that started out on the right path, started out wanting to just follow the gospel and follow what Jesus said. And then we fast forward two, three, four, five hundred years, and we see how far off track they got. And so... <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and I think that's part of the teaching here too. Because if you look at it, it says for whom is, it is tilled, that's part of what tilling is, isn't it? I mean, you till it to aerate the soil, but you also till to get rid of the weeds. And so I think that that's a, an, an, a, an apt application for this as well. So let's go ahead and move on to verses 9 through 12. But beloved, we are convinced of better things regarding you 
and things that accompany salvation, even though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name by having served and by still serving the saints. And we desire that each one of you demonstrate the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and endurance inherit the promises. Now, I think that this passage was included because the author feels like he's been a little harsh on the people he's writing to so far, and I think that that's probably a fair assessment. So if you look at what he's starting out with, he says, we're convinced of better things regarding you. Essentially what he's saying there is, I expect more out of you. And you can see sort of strains of this, like little hints about this earlier in the passages that we've looked through. Like if you remember at the end of chapter 5, what he was talking about is you should be teachers. Well, teaching is a big responsibility. I mean, that's something that is taken very seriously, especially by people that used to be Jews and hold teachers in high regard. And so if that's the case, then I think it's fair to say that the author here, especially since he's talked about them being adequate, God having given them everything that they needed for their spiritual maturity, you're talking about how they should be at the point to where they should be consuming spiritual meat and be teaching other people. The thrust of what he's getting at here is, it would be one thing if he's dealing with, for example, the Corinthians. Because we know from 1 Corinthians, that church had an awful lot of problems. But they were constantly searching the scriptures. They were constantly trying to grow. We don't see any criticism from Paul in Corinthians about them having that issue. They, they had tons of other issues that he had to deal with. But that's not really one of them. But here in Hebrews, the author is essentially saying, I'm saying all of this because I expect better out of you. And this is very parental. I don't know if your dad ever did this with you, but my dad, he used to say, look, son, if you were just a bad student or you weren't all that bright, I'd be satisfied with C's. But I know you can get A's. And that stuck with me. And I think that that's essentially what the author is saying here. He's like, I know that you are capable of more than what you're doing here. And how often is it that really God could say the same of us. I think that's really where this application comes in, is that when we're sort of pushing ourselves and pressing on to this level of spiritual maturity, we should keep that in the back of our mind, that what does God expect of me? Because I don't think that he would ask for anything that's unreasonable or beyond our ability, but if we're looking at the teaching of the previous verse that we were just looking at about there being rain provided and good soil and all the things that you need to do what God asks you to do, I think that we can apply this very aptly. Um, why do you think, to this specific audience, the Hebrew author does expect more? I think that's exactly it. Remember that he's writing to a group of Jewish Christians. And the Jewish Christians, at least in the congregations that were fairly mixed, they've known God for a lot longer. Now granted, their relationship with God has changed substantially since they came to Christ. However, these are people that probably know the Old Testament pretty well, and they've been monotheist for a long time. Pretty much all of the Gentiles that became Christians, they were pagans. And so they had a lot further to go to understand God. And so I think part of the reason that the author is saying that he expects more out of these people and that they should be more spiritually mature than they are, and the, he expects them to be teaching other Christians about the faith, is because he's saying, you guys have the Old Testament background. You didn't have to like deal with coming out of things like uh, idol worship or having to deal with all kinds of different relationships and temptations that the Gentile world did. You guys understand what it's like to love God and to serve Him and to be disciplined and to have a life that looks different from the world around you, this should be something that's a more natural fit for you. And because of that, you should be more mature than this, and you should be teaching the Gentile Christians how to live because you have a little more experience in having a relationship with God. And so 
again, that's somewhat speculative, but I think that that's the reason that he's saying that he expects more out of this group of Jewish Christians, that they should really be the ones leading the charge and helping the Gentile Christians that are coming out of cultural paganism how to live a way that God would, would be accepting of. Um, and then at the end here, where he's talking about uh, so that you will not be sluggish but be imitators of those through faith and endurance inherit the promises. There's a couple different ways that I think you could take this. I think that A, he could be talking about other Christians. He wants them to imitate those that are leaders of the church, people like the apostles. That's certainly a way to read this verse, and I don't think that that's incorrect. However, given the context and what he's been talking about so far, where he talks about those who inherit the promises, I think what he's actually talking about is the faithful Israelites. He's talking about those in contrast to the ones that, remember he talked about those being dead in the wilderness because they didn't have faith? Well, what would the contrast of that be? It would be the ones that actually went in and conquered the Canaan land, right? And so I think that that's actually what he's talking about here is those that inherited the promise of God's land of Canaan. And so he's saying, be like those guys, be like conquerors, be the person that's going to lead the charge and pressing on and wants to develop their relationship and their spiritual maturity to the point to where you can be like a soldier going in and taking land for God. And so I think that that's the kind of imagery he's trying to drum up here. Verses 13 through 16. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear, uh, since he could swear an oath by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For people swear an oath by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath serving as confirmation is an end of every dispute. So, just so you know, the part there that is in bold, or not bold, it's in uh, all caps, that part is a direct quotation from Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 through 17. And the context of what's going on here is that is right after Abraham was prepared to sacrifice Isaac. And so this is when God offers this oath to him saying that I will bless you and multiply you and this is going to be your legacy to the world. And so in the same way that he's talking about there, where he's, he's talking about Abraham, is that happened... And then after the promise was given, there was patience. Because you know, if you know anything about Abraham's life, it took a long time for those promises to be fulfilled. It wasn't really completely fulfilled until Jesus Christ came along. So that's a couple thousand years after Abraham lived. But God, when he's talking about this oath being given, God didn't have to, to give an oath, did he? That wasn't a requirement of him. I mean, he's God, and we know that he can't lie. The, that goes all the way back to the Torah. It says that in Numbers, that God cannot tell a lie. And so if that's the case, why would he even need to give Abraham an oath? Why would he go through that formality? I think it's really for Abraham's sake. He wanted Abraham to be assured that his promise was on its way. The promise is coming, and the way that he chose to swear by this is he said, I'm going to be the thing that I swear on because, you know, he, he's God. He can't swear on anything greater than him. And so he swears on his character. He swears on who he is, his own identity. As sure as I am God, this will happen. And of course, we know that eventually that's the promise that did happen. And that's also the promise that is going to be extended to us. And we'll see that in the next few verses in verses 17 through 20. In the same way God desiring even more to demonstrate to the heirs of the promise the fact that his purpose is unchangeable, confirmed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, again, quoting numbers there, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to hold firmly to the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and reliable, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
So in a similar fashion, that's what's being expressed here, in a similar way that this oath was given to Abraham and that that promise, as sure as God was God, because it's an unchangeable thing, as sure as God was God and as sure as God cannot tell a lie, so that's two unchangeable things. Based on that, Abraham had his promise and was assured that that was what was going to happen. And he says, and in the same way, Jesus has made promises to us. Now, we could reference tons of different promises that Jesus offered. Uh, One that comes to mind just right off the top of my head is in John 14, verse 2, I think, where he says that in my Father's house are many mansions and I go to prepare a place for you. So that's just one of the examples that Jesus has given to us. And the Hebrew author here is saying in the same way that there was no doubt God was going to fulfill his promise to Abraham and Abraham had that assurance because of the way that God had presented that oath to him. In the exact same way, we can have that same level of assurance in what Jesus has promised to us because God, of course, cannot tell a lie. Numbers 23, verse 19. And what that means is that we have no reason to waver in that promise. So then we move on to this really interesting imagery that he uses really in verse 19 where he talks about we have hope as an anchor of the soul and a hope that both sure and reliable and one who enters within the veil. So how can hope, like an anchor, enter a veil? Yeah, I think that that's correct, that Jesus is sort of the personification of hope. And we know, and we're going to talk about this in a little more detail in the the next part, because we're we're about to go into a long discussion about Jesus as the high priest that he's going to be discussing this, Jesus going behind the veil into God's presence and that he's our hope. And so since he is our hope, we're sort of sending Jesus as our representative into God's presence to to be an advocate for us. Now, I say that, I should clarify, not that we're the ones that do the sending, but, you know, that that's what it's talking about here. And so think about it this way. What do you do with an anchor? Right, if you want something to not move, if you want to be assured of something, which is what's being discussed here, You lower the anchor. Can you see the anchor? You can see it when it's above water, sure. But once it goes under the water, you can't see it anymore. And yet, despite this, despite the fact that we can't even see the anchor anymore, the only time that you can't see it is when it's being used to fulfill its purpose. And despite not being able to see the anchor, we can rest assured that that anchor is holding us in position. And I think that that's the same imagery that he's trying to convey here with Jesus. You know, it it talks about over and over again in the Old Testament, Jesus being the invisible God, and now that Jesus has ascended, we can't see Jesus anymore now that he's entered that veil, entered into God's uh, dwelling place to offer intercession for us. But despite this, that's where our hope is, isn't it? That's where our assurance is. Yeah, we, we can't actually see him offering the sacrifice and the intercession for our sin. But we have this unshakable, unmovable hope of assurance that is being discussed in this particular passage of Scripture, specifically because it is Jesus that has entered that veil for us. We may not be able to see him anymore, but that doesn't change the fact that our assurance is still there and it's still rock solid. It is what is holding us in place. I agree, and to that point, What was the very first thing that the devil did to tempt mankind? He murkied the water. He made it less certain. He said, did God really say that if you eat of this fruit that you'll surely die? Like it was just planting that seed of doubt. And you're right that that's exactly what happens when we are tempted with things of this world. That anchor is our assurance and it's something that is steady and knowable and that God has a tie back to us that we can know with certainty that the promises that he's made to us are going to be fulfilled. There's never a promise anywhere in the Bible that God makes that he doesn't make good on. Now, sometimes it was a conditional promise, and the human party did not meet to to God's standard, and because of that, he didn't fulfill that part of the promise. But remember that that promise was conditional. That wasn't God's fault. That was their fault. And so anytime God says he will do something, he does it. And we're going to discuss that a little bit um, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and sort of dip our toe into chapter 7. I know we won't have time to finish it, but I do want to go ahead and, and get to this point since it talks about Jesus' Melchizedek. Which, again, is a we have talked about Jesus' Melchizedek already. This concept has been introduced in our study already, but he's really going to get into the weeds here and, and explain exactly what that means and spill it out for us. 
So we'll look at the first three verses of chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham appointed a tenth of all his spoils, was the first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. He remains a priest perpetually. So to understand the first part of this argument, you have to understand a little bit of the language. But the word Salem is extremely similar to the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. And so he's drawing a correlation between the realm over which Melchizedek presided, the realm over which he was king, Salem, and saying that that word is derived from the Hebrew word for peace. And so he is the king of Salem, which means he is the king of peace. And this actually kind of makes sense because he shows up directly after a battle. Now, he fought in the battle as well. But he's saying, though, once this peace arrives, the king of peace shows up and blesses Abraham. And so that's part of the symbolism there. And then the second half of Melchizedek's name, Zedek, it is the Hebrew way to describe righteousness or living rightly. And so when he talks about him being king of peace and king of righteousness, that's what he's talking about is that the imagery that is used in the Old Testament for Melchizedek is that he's the king of peace and the king of righteousness. And of course, we're going to see that tie into Jesus Christ, who is the king of peace and the king of righteousness. Now, on this part, why is it that he wanted to bring up specifically, well, we'll save that for another time. Um, I'll, just, I'll just go ahead and tell you the answer to this one. Why was it significant that he brought up it was a tenth of his possessions? Because that's how much Israelites had to tithe their priests. So even before there was a Levitical law, even before the law of Moses had been established, you have Abraham, the father of the faith, the source of all Judaism, paying a tenth of his possessions to a priest that was not of the Levitical priesthood. And so the reason that this is being brought up is it is legitimizing Melchizedek's office as a priest. It is acknowledging that even Abraham, the source and father of of the entire Israelite nation is saying, yes, this man is a priest of God. And we'll pick up on it uh, when we come back next week. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.